Welcome, everybody. I'm delighted to be here. I'm uh, as an alum of the University of Chicago and as a, a longtime Asia wonk, um, I'm really delighted that the university has set up this center. I visited it, what, a couple of years ago, just a couple of months after it opened. And uh, I think President Zimmer and with, with Dolly's leadership uh, made a very important move on behalf of the university, on behalf of, of U.S.-China uh, relationships and intellectual exchange. Um, so uh, just a word further about the, uh, the nature of the Council's studies. I know you are all familiar with uh, the work of the Pew Research Center. It's, it's fabulous work. They do a superb job. Um, they've really been around for about 15 years doing high quality public opinion research, including a lot of it on international issues. Um, for us, the good news is that, that the Pew work has only highlighted, I think, the contribution that the council studies are able to make and have made, I believe, now over almost uh, four decades. Uh, and that is that we focus exclusively uh, on how Americans are thinking about the world. Uh, we do so in a very much in-depth, comprehensive fashion. And we have done so over time. So that as you'll see in my presentation, we have a lot of data that, that is consistent because it's come out of our work with very, with very steady uh, approaches over time in terms of methodology, um, in terms of the way we frame our thinking behind the surveys and the survey questionnaires themselves. And, you know, there is something in survey research, as you may know, known as the house effect. And the house effect is you actually see differences between polling houses, even though there are a lot of their questions and techniques and methodologies may be similar, there's actually a systematic difference between the kinds of results they can get, uh, they get over time. So we believe that the Chicago Council's work continues to be very distinctive and certainly it's been very valued by scholars uh, over the nearly four decades it, it's been around and our data will be archived and, and, and publicly available at the Roper Archive in about three or four months. Um, so, um, as Zoe said, this study has come out in a presidential election year. All of our studies are now every two years come out in, in, in a U.S. election year, either the off years of congressional elections or the or presidential election years. And, and that, of course, makes them more timely uh, and relevant and in, sometimes in ways that we don't quite anticipate, and that's the case again this year. So, uh, a word about methodology. Um, this is a totally scientific survey based on uh, all of the key principles of scientific survey research. Um, it is different from what the media use for the most part in that we do not use telephone anymore. We stopped using telephone 10 years ago. We were ahead of our time. Uh, you may be aware that that uh, telephone surveying in, in the United States has become extremely difficult, uh, unreliable, frankly, because of, of cell phones of, uh, and uh, the fact that for a long time cell phones uh, were, or there was no listing of, telef of cell phones. You could, you could do a random digit dialing, accessing to phone numbers, and what you would get, you didn't know whether you can get a landline or a cell phone. Now, Posters can, can understand the difference. Um, in our case, we've used a, a, a technique uh, and a company pioneered by a former University of Chicago professor, Norman Nye, uh, who created a firm called Knowledge Networks. Uh, and they impanel 100,000 American ha households randomly selected, randomly selected according to the RDD, the Random Digit Dialing uh, uh, Technique. Uh, and then uh, those households are in turn sampled each time a client such as the Chicago Council does a study um, based on the number of, of cases we want, the number of questions we will ask and so forth. So uh, this survey is administered over the United, has the additional advantage over telephone that the, the, 
the ability of a respondent to sit down and spend time with a questionnaire, which the nature of our questionnaires requires really, um, is much greater than over a telephone where you're cooking dinner and you get your cell phone rings and it's some pollster who wants to talk to you for 20 minutes. And that's an, become another problem with, with telephone. I, I dwell a little bit more on the methodology than, than I otherwise might because uh, I expect in this audience there are people who are more interested in, and more knowledgeable about those issues than perhaps other audiences I, I sometimes speak to. Um, the data were collected back in June. Um, so they're three months old, but, and we're always worried that some earth-shaking development will occur in the intervening period, and that, that fortunately did not, did not happen this year. I'm going to divide my talk, um, I'm going to give you a little overview first, and then I'm going to divide my talk into four or five sections. First, I'm going to uh, provide you with a, with a, a rapid-paced overview of the key overarching findings of the survey in terms of how Americans are thinking first about the experience of American in the world over the last decade, um, basically since 9-11. Um, how in light of that experience, how, do American, how are Americans thinking about our role in the world? And then Given that understanding, that preference, set of preferences they have about our role in the world, what do they perceive to be the most effective and least costly means of achieving our foreign policy goals? Then I'm going to turn to a, an equally brief focus on the Middle East, which of course is, figures very importantly given what's going on in the region, including of course the events of the last week, which we obviously did not anticipate. Um, and then I'm going to turn to the bulk of the, of the presentation, which is about Asia. Because one of the headlines of this study in 2012 is that we, we, we describe it as Americans are reorienting, uh, deliberately a play on the words, uh, to Asia. Uh, at, the, at this moment, this uh, moment of transition from a decade in which Americans were utterly preoccupied with the struggle against terrorism, uh, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and they're now beginning to look to Asia in a much more intense way and with, with largely positive but not uncomplicated results. So I've already covered a little bit of this, but 10 years after 9-11, 11 years after 9-11, Americans are really recalibrating um, how we go about acting in the world, and obviously this recalibration is also influenced, has been influenced by the, the uh, financial crisis and its economic aftermath at home and a desire on the part of Americans to refocus our energies as a nation uh, on rebuilding our economic vitality and strength. Um, historically, the Council has been very concerned about understanding to what extent Americans might be reverting to some kind of isolationist stance. Um, that partly comes from our own DNA as an organization. The Chicago Council was founded in 1922 in response to the rise of isolationism, particularly in the Midwest, particularly led by the then publisher of the Chicago Tribune, Robert McCormick. Um, and as you all know, by the end of the 20s, um, America was in full, fa full scale isolationist retreat from the world. Um, so that's a part of our, of our coming into being that we, we relate to. Um, Americans are not uh, in full flight from an international, the international engagement that has dominated our thinking now for uh, ever since World War II. Uh, but we are seeing some qualification of that commitment to international engagement. Um, they still believe that, that uh, our leadership in the world is positive or can be positive, um, but they, they show a very much more cautious and selective approach to how that leadership is exercised. Um, they see the Middle East with great worry and confusion, frankly, as I think will become evident. And then they look to Asia, as I've mentioned, uh, with, with considerable optimism. They see it as a region of opportunity rather than threat, uh, but again, not uncomplicated. So first, on the, what, what is the, what's the takeaway in the American mind 
uh, from the last decade. Um, there is diminished concern. Not surprisingly, we've had fortunately no major uh, terrorist incidents in the United States and the, and the homeland since 9-11. There is diminished concern about the threats of international terrorism, not across the board. Um, Another very important thing is that in, in 2002, we, we, we did our sur first survey after 9-11 in 2002, middle of 2002, and to a degree not seen since World War II, Americans were focused intently on one set of objectives, one set of perceptions about our place in the world and our, our th the threats facing us and our goals as a nation. And that consensus was across partisan lines, it was across generational lines, uh, there was really no differentiators, an extraordinary degree of consensus. It's hard to get Americans uh, into that kind of consensus on almost any issue at any time. It's a remarkable finding in, in public opinion research. Um, and they were, they were uh, in JFK's words, they were willing to bear any burden, pay any price um, to what they thought would, would accomplish, would, would make us safer from terrorism in the, frankly, in the sort of post-traumatic state that Americans were in after 9-11. After uh, and yet, uh, today we find that Americans are really disillusioned with the efforts that we made in the last decade, and particularly with the two wars and their and what they perceive to be their lack of effect in terms of our key goals, uh, and they are preoccupied with the economic issues we face. Uh, this is a graph of uh, the perceptions of terrorism as a critical threat to the United States. Um, as you can see, in 2002, there were these high, very high levels. I mean, to get nine of 10 Americans to agree about anything is remarkable, and, and this was a finding that really stunned us at the time. And what we've seen is a steady downward trend um, in, the, in the perceptions of terrorism as a critical threat to the United States. Similarly, a downward trend in the threat of, of nuclear nonproliferation. Now, in 2002, of course, we had not fortunately experienced a nuclear event in the United States, but it shows that this general sense of uh, of feeling threatened that came out of the 9-11 experience uh, uh, is dissipating. Uh, on Islamic fundamentalism, which tended to go along with that, but it clearly at a lower level, uh, the concern of Americans about that as a threat has also diminished, though not as sharply, because it wasn't as high uh, as in the beginning. Uh, we looked this year at, at age cohort differences, um, and we haven't always done this, but we saw some tantalizing, tantalizing evidence early on that it, there might be important differences. And I'm mentioning this now because it, it's, this is shot through the entire survey. What we're finding is a group we call the millennials, the age cohort between 18 and 29, are, are seeing the world in rather different terms than almost any other age group. In some cases, they club with the next age group up, the 30 to 44 uh, year old Americans and their perceptions. But we, we resisted the, the temptation to call, say that millennials are leading the change because we think it's, this is at least partially an age cohort effect where younger Americans and younger Americans almost at every time and every circumstance see the world in more optimistic terms or less threatening terms than old folks like me who are, who've been uh, beaten down by life. Um, uh, but there is clearly an experiential effect going on here as well. We also looked at party differences, and these uh, have also turned out to be interesting. Um, and it perhaps won't surprise you given um, the stance that, that uh, uh, President, the uh, uh, candidates have taken, the, uh, Mr. Romney, Governor Romney has taken, that uh, Republicans as a general matter see a more threatening environment around the United States. And this is but one example. If I could show you all of the threats, you would see the red line, the Republican line. I don't know if everybody can see it. R is, uh, red is Republican, blue it's obvious for those Americans in the audience. Blue is Democratic. and, and um, Yellow is independence. Uh, and Republicans are generally have higher threat perceptions than, 
than do Democrats and independents. Um, some of you may know or may not know that today the American electorate self-identified according to whether they are Republican, Democratic, or Republicans or Democrats or independents is roughly divided into thirds. This is a real change in the American body politic from 20 or 30 years ago, certainly uh, when Republicans and Democrats, uh, the two parties dominated political identity in American life. Now independents have really come forward as a, uh, as a major force. And um, what we're finding here in general, again, you'll see in other places in my presentation that the independents are acting quite independently. They are, their perceptions differ from those of Republicans and Democrats in, on, on many items, uh, but they are closer to Democrats. So this is one politically salient finding of our study that we didn't anticipate and that has been picked up a lot, in, understandably, in the US environment, political environment right now by the media, showing that uh, uh, if independents are a large part of the swing votes in the November election, uh, then the Romney foreign policy that's been enunciated so far is going to alienate them rather than attract them to his candidacy. I've mentioned the, dis the dissatisfaction uh, with the wars in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. If I, this is the uh, uh, Afghanistan graph since 2007, so we could have gone back sooner in the, uh, earlier in the case of Iraq. It would, the whole thing would have been shifted backwards by three or four years in the case of Iraq, but the graph otherwise would look exactly the same. You know, so after about four, five, six years of the Afghan conflict, Americans, uh, their support for the war began to, 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 uh, re to be reduced. Uh, and then about three years ago, the lines crossed and there was greater opposition to the conflict than, than more. And the same happened in Iraq um, at an earlier point in time. We asked, do you think that in each case, for both uh, Iraq and Afghanistan separately, we asked, do you think the war has uh, made us safer as a nation from terrorism? No, was the majority answer. Do you think that, that the war has advanced the cause of democracy in, in the region, whether in the Middle East or South Asia? Majority answer was no. Uh, do you think that the conduct of this war has alienated us further, the United States further, from uh, Muslim societies in the Middle East and South Asia? The answer was yes. Uh, do you think that the, the war suggest, will suggest to future American <laughs> leaders that trying to bring about regime change in countries far away through military force is a bad idea, and the answer was resoundingly yes. So that is a very formative part of this last decade experience, not surprisingly. So what do they take away from this? Um, they still do support an active U.S. role in world affairs. Um, uh, they still see the United States as the most influential country in the world, despite the setbacks they, they think we've, we've uh, uh, sustained over the last decade. Um, but they see China and other powers rising in influence, um, particularly China. Um, and at the same time, American exceptionalism is alive and well in the minds of Americans. So we asked them, do you think that the United States is a, is a nation of unique character um, that provides essential leadership in the world, is the greatest country in the world? And 70% of Americans said yes. So what we're seeing here is not a, a retreat from the historic confidence that rightly or wrongly is born of that sense of American exceptionalism, rather what we're seeing is a much more cautious appro approach to the application of our energy and assets and power in the world. Um, and at the same time, they are, they are comfortable with the rise of other powers, including here in Asia. So here's the graph on, on the active part. There's a question, it's the touchstone question on the isolationism versus internationalism. 
uh, concern that pollsters have been asking Americans about for decades. And the question goes, should, very simply, do you think the United States should play, continue to play or play an active part in world affairs or stay out of world affairs? And um, what we're seeing here is that uh, a majority still says, yes, we should play an active part in world affairs, but it's certainly the lowest uh, number uh, percentage since 2002. So you can see that same slow decline, if you will, in, that, in, uh, in the sense of engagement in the world of internationalism. And you've seen a rise in those who will say stay out. In fact, the stay out number is the highest we've ever seen it in the Chicago Council's polling and one of the highest in the history of polling on this question going back to just the period right after World War II. So the gap between those who I say active part and those who stay out uh, is the smallest, uh, again, in our polling on this question, which suggests that there is a tentativeness at this point to Americans' willingness to be forward-leaning in our involvement in the world. Um, I spoke about their being comfortable with the rise of, of regional powers, and this question focused on Turkey and Brazil, which many of you will recall uh, came together to attempt to bring about a, a, a solution on the Iranian nuclear en enrichment issue, and it fell apart, it didn't work, the U.S. opposed it in the end. But with that experience in the background, we asked Americans, so how do you feel about the idea that Tur countries like Turkey and Brazil, so we didn't ask about China, we asked about Turkey and Brazil, um, uh, start to exhibit independent foreign policies. And they said, oh, that's fine. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a good thing. Um, we would welcome more, peop more countries coming, coming to the task of providing international leadership. Let me make it very clear that what is not happening in, in our assessment of, of American public opinion in this stage is that Americans are, are backing away from uh, the use of force and the use of or, a force in, in an organized fashion in the way of nation states through their militaries. Uh, that's not at all the case. Americans remain very committed to U.S. maintaining its military superiority worldwide, um, we ask that, that the question that way. Um, but they're much less likely to support its use. They're much more conditional about the support of its use. They want to see diplomacy uh, and economic sanctions and other measures employed before we set about using force once again. Um, so this is the, one of the slides that demonstrates that ongoing commitment to military superiority. Um, by far the largest uh, percentage of Americans say yes, uh, uh, maintaining U.S. military superiority is the most effective way we can achieve our foreign policy goals. That doesn't mention it all, mean, mean it also always has to be used. Uh, they also see other measures as being effective. Um, but it's clearly military superiority is at the top of their priority list. And just to, to make it a little more concrete, we said, well, how do you feel about the United States maintaining long-term military bases, that is, bases in other countries around the world? And um, the percentage is still a majority, 61%, if you combine those who say more bases and those who say about as many as, as now. Um, it's down from 2002 when 82%, is that right? 82% said we want to have either as many bases as now or more bases. Again, remember that was this high point of American internationalism. We can go out in the world and solve our problems through the use of force and in other ways. Um, and the number who say we want fewer bases, bases around the world has gone up dramatically uh, over those 10 years. Um, now, this partly reflects also concern about the federal budget and deficits and debt uh, and our ability to afford this. Um, but even under those circumstances, even in light of the, their very negative assessments of the results of the two wars, even in light of the, of the concerns about the economy and the federal budget deficits, um, still 
three out of five Americans support uh, maintaining U.S. bases around the world, including, of course, uh, very importantly, here in Asia. Um, at the same time, when you get situational with Americans and you pose a particular situation to them, a particular threat, uh, they become much more discriminating about the use of force. And just to make it really hard for them, we brought in the Iran issue, which is, of course, on everybody's mind. There is strong consensus among Americans that the Iranian nuclear program is a th potential threat to the United States, uh, not only to the region, not only to Israel. Um, and uh, we said, how, can, how should we go about trying to deal with this problem? And the great majority, 80% in each case, said, you know, we've got to use diplomacy, we've got to use economic sanctions. We said, well, how about military, a U.S. military strike? And half as many, 45%, supported that. Now, that's 45%, given what I've already told you about their reticence on to use the U.S. military, again, uh, is, a, is a substantial number, but still certainly below a majority. And so this just indicates that, that uh, proclivity of Americans to... Uh, use military force as a, as a last resort, which it usually is in statecraft. Um, they also, when, they, when it comes to the possibility of using force, uh, they want to do so as much as possible in, a, in combination with other countries. They want to do so in a multilateral framework. Um, and this is an example of this. We've been asking this question actually for longer than going back before 2004. We asked a question, do you think the United States, with UN uh, authorization, um, ought to provide U.S. ground troops in the event that North Korea were to invade South Korea? If you do so, if you ask them that question with UN involved, you get a pretty solid and even major majority. Look at that, almost two, two out of three saying consistently across now in this particular eight year period, yes. If you say, well, should the US act unilaterally in the event of a, a DPRK, ROK conflict? Only 40%. So you have a majority in one case and not a majority in the other. Um, which again demonstrates this desire to embed our use of force in international practice and partnership. Why? I mean, my interpretation of this is, number one, Americans want to, to share, to have our burdens shared. And number two, and I would argue more importantly, they want the legitimacy that they feel would come from international cooperation, as in Afghanistan, the kind of international cooperation that we did not get in Iraq. Um, and whether it's a legitimacy of the UN or legitimacy under a NATO umbrella, as in the case of, of Libya, it's very important to them in thinking about the use of force. We asked a question, do you, where do you see the most of the threats to the United States coming over the next decade or two, Middle East, Asia, or somewhere else? Uh, and we found that a 73% a, a said Middle East. So they clearly, the Middle East uh, absolutely is the greatest source of concern for Americans as they look out in the world. Asia only 19% and somewhere else, admittedly very vague, only 7%. Let me come back actually. Um, if I were to personally characterize, my colleagues on our study team might not share this characterization. If I were to personally characterize this, I, I would say Americans are utterly in a quandary about what to do about the Middle East. Um, they see this as predominantly, overwhelmingly the source of threats to us for whether it's the Iranian nuclear program or the potential for conflict, you know, Israeli-Palestinian conflict or some uh, or the tragedy unfolding in Syria, or whatever is going to come as a result of the Arab Spring, and they don't really know that. Um, they're very uncertain about that. They don't know, they don't see a path to how the United States can have an effective Middle East policy that will deal with those threats um, in, a, in an effective uh, fashion. Um, 
And you'll see that that includes the case of Iran in an even more telling way than I've already described. They also want to back away from providing economic assistance to Egypt. It's the first time in our polling that we've seen a majority of Americans want to decrease or stop altogether U.S. economic assistance to Egypt. Um, so we asked an even more difficult question. We said, suppose that Israel attacks the Iranian nuclear facilities, Iran re retaliates, and Israel and Iran are for all intents and purposes at war with each other. Should the United States come in militarily with, with its troops and, and forces in support of Israel? And 60% said no. Now, when you consider that nuclear proliferation is right at the top of American threat concerns, and the relationship with Israel is of a historic and deep character, for 60% of Americans to say no is a very significant finding. It's getting gotten coverage all over the Middle East in the last two weeks. Um, now, I want to underscore for you that it is all situational in the end, and if, if the events that we hypothetically described in our question were to actually occur, and the President of the United States were to come out and say we have to do something, this is, a, this is something that could change. Um, but I want to underscore the kind of sense of where, of where Americans are thinking now, their state of mind. So, turning to Asia now. Um, Americans look at Asia with some optimism and a sense of comfort about the, the lesser threats. Um, they see China's growth, China's growth both economically and in, and in influence, uh, not in a threatening fashion, but not in an uncomplicated fashion. Uh, and they, in, distinct, in contradistinction to their perceptions of the Middle East, they see uh, the U.S. military presence in Asia at this point in time as a positive thing, and they look to South Korea and Japan to be our partners in the region, as they are, already are under our <coughs> treaty relationships, although that's complicated, need I tell all of you, um, when we're reading the headlines every day, not only here, but back in the United States about the, the, the dispute between uh, Japan and, and the PRC over the Dayotai, Senkaku Islands, and I've been, every meeting I've had here today, I've been asked, does the United States side with Japan, you know, uh, on this issue? And I say, ask Hillary Clinton or Leon Panetta. Um, so we've been asking this question again for going back to 1994 and actually before, um, which is more important the United States, Asia, or Europe? And for the first time, uh, since 1994, a majority, a slight majority, says Asia is more important. Um, and this, as you can see, it's been a steady downward trend in Europe and a steady upward trend uh, for, uh, for Asia. Um, and I've already spoken to you about this one. So then we ask, all right, which countries, rate, rate the influence of countries in the world we asked this question in 2002, we asked it again this year, and then we ask, what do you think about the influence of these countries 10 years from now? And so what you see is that a very steady decline in the self-perceived influence of the United States on the part of Americans. Still, however, in their mind, the most influential country in the world, and a very steady rise in the estimation of Americans of China's influence and projecting China's, the growth in Chinese influence out to a point 10 years from now, this is in their estimation, very close to that, uh, to a position very close to that of, of the United States. Uh, the only other countries on this graph that have upward sloping lines from 2012 to 2022 are to other Asian countries, uh, India and South Korea. Uh, Europe, in the, in the estimation of the American public, has gone down very slightly uh, in influence. So has Japan, and so has Russia. Um, so this, this again, demonstrates the, that China is really beginning to loom much larger in the American mind. Um, they see the rise of China as both an opportunity and challenge. Uh, 
They are divided on whether China is a rival or a partner. Uh, and their focus to Asia, on Asia and China is really built around uh, what's going on economically rather than in the security realm. This is a question, again, we've been asking for a good long while, which is more important to the United States, Japan or China? And again, you see the lines crossed in 2002. Uh, if you went back, the gap is about this wide going back into the 90s and certainly into the 1980s when, uh, when Japan loomed larger also. Um, and clearly now there's a, a, a very strong perception that, that uh, China has overtaken in importance to the United States, uh, Japan by a long shot. Um, and they have also come to the understanding that China's economy is growing and is going to be as large as or larger than that of the United States uh, in years to come. And that perception is now very steadily at three and four of Americans believe that to be the case. Um, they also have come to understand that Americans owe more to China, uh, the United States owes more to China in the aggregate sense of, of current account deficits uh, than uh, China owes to the United States. And surprisingly, only in 2006, that was not the perception. But boy, when Americans got it, they really got it. And of course, it's the financial crisis that brought that home and all the discussion at the time around China's holdings of treasury securities and, and uh, Hank Paulson's efforts to, to uh, ensure that the, the Chinese government didn't begin to sell large blocks of treasury securities and make the situation worse for us anyway. Um, and they, about half of Americans see our debt to China as a critical threat to the United States. Now, how much of that threat is because it's from China and how much of it's because it's from, because it's debt, which has become a four letter word in the American vocabulary right now, um, is not clear. But it, it, it is a factor in the, in the perceptions of China. And we asked, is the development of China as a world power a critical threat, and not an important but not a critical threat, or not a threat to the United States. These are the threat perceptions. Um, so you see debt to China, 52% say it's a critical threat. And then we asked a question about the development of China as a world power. Um, a much broader uh, articulation of a concern about China as a threat, uh, and that's lower. That's only 40% of Americans say it's a critical threat. Now, you might say that's a non-trivial percentage, but it, it, is, it is still uh, down, the, down the chain, down the ladder, down the priority list of, of their threat perceptions. It's decreased furthermore. So the high point of that perception, at least in, in our findings going back to 1990, uh, was the period between 94 and 2000, 98, 2002. That's the post-Tiananmen period. Uh, and it took a decade for Americans to begin to think of China again in a, in a, a more uh, benign fashion. Um, but it's been pretty steady at this 36 to 40 percent uh, seeing China as a, as a critical threat to the United States. Um, uh, rising slightly over the last few years, but not, but not alarmingly. So we asked, do you see the United States and China more as rivals or as partners? Um, and again, we see a crossing of the lines, a convergence of opinions. So Americans are equally, an equal number of Americans are inclined to see China as a partner as, the, as are inclined to see it a rival. Um, we asked about the impact of China's economic growth on the United States. And right now, the, the plurality of Americans, 49%, see, see China's economic growth as equally positive and negative. Uh, it's a complicated thing, uh, this impact. You can imagine what might be the components of that ambivalent judgment. The troubling thing in this graph, in this finding, is that 40% say it's mostly negative. And I've said to some uh, Chinese interlocutors here today that, that I think in this lies the potential for a negative turn in U.S.-China relations if we aren't able to manage our economic differences.
pretty well in the years to come. We uh, asked whether China is an unfair trader. Now, Americans, we believe, label as an unfair trader any country uh, that has a large trade surplus with the United States. So you can take this with a grain of salt. Um, you can see what happened in the case of Japan in the 1980s. Japan was in the unfair trader box uh, and has now emerged to be perceived in the dark blue line as a fair trader. China remains in the unfair trader category in the perceptions of most Americans and pretty steadily up there. You can understand why, uh, from a purely political standpoint, uh, President Obama and Governor Rodney seem to be competing for who can uh, criticize China uh, more on the issue of, of our trade relationship. Uh, millennials are, again, very distinctive in their attitudes on Asia and China. Um, uh, more millennials than any other age group see Asia as more important to the United States than Europe. Um, fewer millennials than any other age group see China as a threat to the United States' vital interests. Uh, more millennials than any, any other age group see China as more important to the U.S. than Japan. Uh, and fewer millennials than any other age group see China as an unfair trader. So I've also said to my Chinese interlocutors, you know, if you think about Chinese public diplomacy in the United States, you know, you ought to go after those millennials because they're the future two or three decades down the road. They're going to be the American leaders who will guide American thinking and policy towards China. And, and they seem to be favorably inclined at this point. Um, on U.S.-China relations, I've spoken about the perceptions of rival and partner. You can see the, uh, the perceptions of China compared to Japan and Korea. So even though the Americans see Japan as less important, they see us as being um, uh, mostly partners and a very high percentage see us being mostly partners with, with Japan and a somewhat lesser percentage of seeing, uh, seeing us as mostly partners with the ROK. Um, and then we asked, well, do you think that Americans should base their policy on seeking engagement and cooperation with China, or should we base it on attempting to limit the rise of Chinese power, as if that were possible for us? We didn't get into that question, obviously. And again, two, three out of, uh, two out of three Americans say definitely for engagement and cooperation. So there is this overall positive assessment of China, its implications for the U.S., and how we should deal with China as a policy matter. Uh, this chart is going to be unreadable by most of you. It's a, uh, a listing of different policy objectives for the United States and our dealings with, the, uh, with Japan and the ROK. Um, and I put it on here to, to illustrate that, again, limiting the rise of Chinese power is the least important priority uh, in terms of policy initiatives that Americans see in our relationships with, with our treaty allies and partners, Japan and Korea. And this is a, a very similar finding vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the first one was Japan, this one's South Korea. We ask, well, given the importance of these partnerships with Japan and the ROK, do you think uh, we should really focus on building up those partners, str strengthening those partnerships, or should we focus instead, even at the expense of our traditional allies, on building a new partnership with China? And still a majority, but a, a small majority, says we got to focus on those traditional uh, alliance relationships. But what's interesting here is that the percentage who say, um, we should build a new partnership with China, even if it might diminish our relations with traditional allies, has gone a little bit up between, in only two years, from 2010 to 2012. So this might also suggest a trend to be watched in the years ahead. Um, Americans regard our military presence in Asia benignly, as I already mentioned to you. 60% say it's stabilizing for the region. Uh, again, such a contrast with their perceptions of the Middle East. Um, they, um, we asked about, this is a result of a cross-tabulation between two questions. Uh, those who see China's power, growing power as a, as a critical threat to the United States are more inclined 
um, uh, to see our military presence in this part of the world as a, as a positive thing. So there is a connection to a threat perception. Um, and there's also here a, a particularly high level of support for military bases, um, particularly in the case of, of Japan, less so in the case of South Korea. It's been declining slowly, but it's still a majority support. And in fact, the support for US bases in Japan is the highest for our bases anywhere in the world. So we asked about bases in Turkey. We asked about bases in, Tur in Germany. We asked about bases um, elsewhere in Asia. And far and away, Japan gets the most public support. Um, and you can understand why in this context. I'm going to go skip both of these again. Um, we looked at the relationship between the threat perception of China um, and a question that was embedded in those earlier slides about the US working with Japan and Korea to build a regional security alliance uh, in Asia. And again, not surprisingly, it is related to the perception of China as a threat. So Americans connect these things in, your, in their minds. Uh, and you can see the relationship here in the data where much higher percentages of those who, who um, uh, among those who see a critical threat, much higher percentages see uh, creating a regional security alliance as a high priority. Um, some of you may have heard of the Pacific pivot that the Obama administration announced last fall. A uh, modest majority of Americans, 54%, support the pivot. I'm not sure they entirely understand it, but they sort of garnered enough about it to, to, to uh, believe it was worthwhile. But it's a modest number, um, and perhaps not surprising given the newness of the initiative. It is not related to the perception of a Chinese threat. So however the administration played this out, and you know they're here in China uh, and elsewhere around the region, there has been a lot of criticism of the so-called pivot to Asia of the Obama administration as, as um, uh, being deliberately aimed at containing China. In the minds of Americans, that's not the case. They see it as part of a larger fabric of American engagement in Asia. Uh, so whatever the administration's intentions were, um, that's not how Americans are interpreting it. Um, and in fact, when we asked about the, uh, uh, we related the support for the pivot to, pivot to perceptions of China as a threat, um, we found no relationship in the data. Um, we then asked about, uh, about the support for the pivot among different age groups, and here's a slightly greater number of millennials and, and uh, young and uh, 30 to 44 year old uh, adults supported then, particularly the 60 pluses folks who are uh, still, as I said, more wed to, to, uh, uh, to Europe. Um, so finally, I'm going to talk about the partisan uh, preferences here. Uh, and again, they're rather interesting. Um, Democrats and independents, you'll see the same pattern of Democrats and independents being sort of like this on the, on the chart, and the Republicans are down here. Um, so the, there is a clear differentiation. Here, Republicans are more inclined to still see Europe um, as being more important to the United States compared to Democrats and independents. Um, uh, on the development of China as a world power, um, Republicans are modestly more likely to see uh, the development of China as a world power as a threat to the United States. But it, what's most striking about this graph is that, uh, and it's an intimation of a larger phenomenon we found in the data, there's actually a very high degree of bipartisanship in American thinking about our policies in Asia. Um, as contrasted with, say, our policies in the Middle East, where Republicans and Democrats on uh, Republicans on one side, Democrats and independents on the other side, are on the opposite sides of, of, of majority view. Um, Republicans, uh, consistent with what I said earlier about Republican threat perceptions, more likely to see the debt as a threat. Plus, debt has been a, uh, uh, a, a critical issue in the eyes of Republicans, as you know. Um, 
if China's economy were to go to be as large as that of the United States, what would be the effect? Uh, again, Democrats and independents are more likely to say positive and negative. Republicans are more likely to say mostly negative. Um, should we build a new partnership with China? Um, again, Democrats and independents more likely, not a majority, but more likely to say yes, we should than Republicans. Uh, but the Republicans come out more strongly in favor of the use of the U.S. military in various Asian, Asian contingencies, such as the North Korea, South Korea scenario I told you about earlier, or the use of troops in the event of a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. This is, again, a question we've been asking for 30 years. Um, and uh, what we've seen over the time, and you can see the continuing trend here, is a steady downhill slide in support for any American military involvement in the event of a conflict over Taiwan between the PRC and, and uh, the island. Um, and here the divide is quite wide, although again, uh, all, the, all the parties and groups are on the same side of the majority line. Um, support for bases is higher among Republicans uh, in both Japan and Korea. So overall, as I've said, Americans are recalibrating. Um, they're, uh, they're war weary and war wary. Uh, they've had a difficult decade. They don't feel that their ambition to um, shape world events in a way that would lessen the threats they felt in the aftermath of 9-11 uh, have been effective. Uh, they don't quite know what to do about that part of the world from whence they see those threats most prominently coming in the years ahead. And in this environment, at the same time, being optimists, they're looking to Asia as a, with an optimistic view for the opportunities it provides, particularly on the economic side. But I want to underscore that, you know, as a somebody who's been looking at Asia for 30 years, um, I see potential trouble in here, in the ambivalence that Americans have on a number of perceptions about the region, and particularly about the relationship with China. And I think uh, the developments, events of the last couple of years in U.S.-China relations, uh, the tone of contention that's entered into a lot of our interactions with China, both on economic issues and now more recently on regional security issues um, such as South China Sea, um, if not more effectively managed by both governments and uh, kept within within reasonable bounds, uh, poses a threat um, to the kind of consensus on the United States side that we now have uh, in broad, in both partisan terms and, and in generational terms, although less so among millennials, around uh, the, the potential and, the, and actually the overall sort of benign and positive effects of our, of our close, closer tie to China. Let me stop there and happy to take questions.